So do you, like Billy Joel, want to know who started the fire? Saul Alinsky did. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debate, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're going to be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. If you are not black, if your skin is not brown, if you are not melanated, then you do not have the right to come under my videos talking back to my people. Your opinions are not wanted, nor are they relevant. So why do you feel like you need to come and keep saying something to my people? You need to ask me my permission before you speak or comment on my videos. You come under my video and say, Lord, may I please have your permission to say something then you wait for me to give you my permission before you start tapping, moving your little pasty fingers around on my page. You people have been talking way too much for way too long and your time is officially up. It is black power forever. So that is a video by a woman on TikTok who calls herself the black messiah. <laughs> the Black Messiah. You've heard of God complexes. She has one. And it raises an interesting question, and that is, how did this woman get to be like this? She's like the black version of the Ku Klux Klan. She's, she's just as racist as she can be, and she's full of hate. She's full of hate. Now, hate is a key word on today's podcast, and part of the answer to the question, how she became like this, is Saul Alinsky. Now, it's hard to convince people of almost anything. You know this if you've ever discussed politics, religion, or sports with a friend or a colleague who doesn't share your views. They just seem immovable on an issue, or it seems that, that facts are like, as my father used to say, water off a duck. It just rolls right off, makes no difference. Now, Marxist political theorist Saul Alinsky, he understood this about human nature. And he understood, like Karl Marx, whose theories he sought to implement, that hate is one of the most powerful of human emotions. People need little encouragement to hate. It comes natural to us. It's actually quite frightening. It's important to have a Christian worldview. The question becomes, how do we build that? How do we develop that? Oftentimes we have Bible teachers who are very faithful in teaching scripture, but don't ever quite make the connection with the outside world. Other times we have Bible teachers who don't really want to touch certain topics because they're just seem to be too toxic. At Tomap.com, you are going to find a wide range of issues being addressed to help you build out that Christian worldview. They're on things from, from suffering, uh, dealing with mental health, to racial reconciliation. These are all issues that you will find at Tomap.com. 
www.christianworldviewmedia.com and they'll help you to build out a Christian worldview and to flourish. I hope you learn a lot from the podcast, but you can go beyond the podcast to the courses that we offer at Tome. So I hope you'll take a look at them and sign up. To get access to more than 100 Tome courses, use the code IDEAS. And for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all kinds of courses on a wide variety of subjects. Individuals with expertise, with experience in subjects that will be meaningful to you. So use the code IDEAS and for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all of them. Go to tomeapp.com. Back to the podcast. Did you guys see this week the, the reactions on social media to the downing of this submarine? The submarine that had, a, was it five people on it? Even Babylon B, and I like Babylon B. Seth Dillon, I like Babylon B. Didn't like this. They were dunking on this, uh, putting out little memes, little jokes. It's hateful. People were suffering and dying, and their families, by the way, are still suffering. Imagine that's your loved one, your son, your brother, your husband who died on that submarine that went down to look at the Titanic. And you look at social media, and it's all these, these memes of dark humor that are dunking on this as though we're talking about, you know, um, you know, Biden falling down while addressing cadets at the Naval Academy, you know, or something like that, which, which was funny. But no one got killed in that. No one suffered in that. But people were dumping out, dumping out hate on these people. And here's another thing that I noticed about it. Class consciousness very much played a part in that dark humor. Uh, when, I, when I pushed back and said, hey, be better than this. Don't do this. Don't, don't see this as an opportunity for you to crack a joke when someone else is suffering. Don't do this. And people replied to me with things like this. They're billionaires. They're billionaires. They deserve what they get. What does their wealth have to do with anything? There is something, you know, that I, I think of as a kind of reverse snobbery. It goes in the other direction. You may, feel, you may feel somebody thinks they're better than you because they have money. Do you think you're better than someone else because you don't have money? It goes the same way. Point is, do you see how easy it is? that hate comes bubbling up. And so you don't hear this as some sort of self-righteous rant on my part. I've done it. I'm, I'm aware of my own wickedness. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If you've ever fathomed the depths of your own dark heart, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You do. You do. It's these latent human characteristics and animosities that Marx and his later disciple, Saul Alinsky, sought to stoke among people. Again, people did this about the submarine without any encouragement, but imagine if someone is stoking those resentments, stoking that hate, and it's all for the purpose of what Tacitus and actually Philip II of uh, Macedonia, the father of Alexander the Great, he's credited with coming up with this divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, you divide people, you turn them against each other, and then they're made that much easier to conquer, to defeat. And long before Philip II said it, Satan has been doing it. He's been doing it ever since. The, the, first, the first thing he did when he slithered into the Garden of Eden was to try to drive a wedge between God and man. 
Marxists have a very cynical understanding of human nature, and they understand this about human nature. You might not be able to change a man's opinion on his sports team. You might not be able to immediately change a man's opinion on his politics or his religion, but it is very easy to convince people they are victims. It is very easy to convince people they're victims. I said this in a little short video clip on Twitter and Jordan Peterson immediately picked up on it and, um, and, and retweeted it with comment because he recognized that it's true. If you read the Communist Manifesto, it's, it's about victimhood at bottom. It's a godless narrative of victimhood. And Saul Alinsky who saw his own work as a kind of sequel to the Communist Manifesto, he instructed his followers to stoke resentments. Now, perhaps you're thinking there's no rhyme or reason to what's going on in America. You see statues being toppled. You see, you see riots in the street. You see defund the police. Um, all these things, the, the, the trans movement, which we discussed in a previous podcast about what took place at the, the White House. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, there's no rhyme. That none of this, none of this makes any sense whatsoever. I will agree with this. It makes no sense from a conventional point of view, from a conventional American point of view. You, 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 you try various keys uh, in that lock and the tumblers don't line up. They do line up with a Marxist key. They do line up and make sense with a Marxist key. And that is because these are individuals who are following a playbook. A playbook, and the playbook was written by Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky, who was born in 1902 and died in 1972, he was an American of Jewish parentage. He was born in, in Chicago and raised in Chicago, and he dedicated his life to Marxist thought, to Marxist writing, and to political agitation, which he didn't call political agitation. You know what he called it? Community organizing community organizing, and many of you already know that phrase because you know the most famous of community organizers who we'll come to in, uh, in just a few moments. But Alinsky was a, a great admirer of not only Marx, who was like himself merely a, a theorist, but he was an admirer of Vladimir Lenin, who was a practitioner of Marxist thought. Lenin's tactics for societal disruption have been implemented in one form or another by communists and fascists alike. In fact, Adolf Hitler used Lenin's tactics uh, with his brown shirts. The brown shirts are like BLM or, or Antifa. That, that the, the role that they were to play was societal disruption at the level of physical intimidation, of blocking roads, of throwing Molotov cocktails through business windows. This is what they were about, to intimidate you into either um, you know, signing up and joining their ranks or at the very least acquiescing and just quietly going along. And you see, Alinsky, Alinsky learned from both the tactics of Lenin and the tactics of Hitler. Now, again, these are Marxist Marxist tactics, but they can be used by fascists, they can be used by communists, but the point is the tactics themselves can be used by anybody. And Alinsky, Alinsky was studying these tactics for the purpose of the seizure of power. So what's happening in our streets today are, are Marxist tactics that have, you know, they'd have no absolute beginning. They, they didn't begin with Sololinsky. They didn't begin with Hitler. They didn't begin with Lenin. They didn't begin with Marx himself. Actually, the Jacobins and further back were using these kind of tactics. But you might say that Sololinsky is the guy who organized all of this into a coherent little book, or I should say coherent books that are just simple little handbooks for people to use. So he's, he's written two that have become holy writ for the left. The first is called Reveille for Radicals. It was published in 1946. It's not nearly as famous as, uh, as the second, but it, it is a book that, um, that has garnered, you know, a lot of attention in recent years. And then the much more famous Rules for Radicals, 
Rules for Radicals that was published in 1971, just, just before his death. Both books are openly, proudly Machiavellian. Now, if you don't know who Niccolo Machiavelli was, he was an Italian political theorist of the 16th century. He's most famous for a book called The Prince. And the most famous line from The Prince, which you would all know, even if you've never read it, is the end justifies the means. Very controversial line, and for good reason, because it's an amoral line. The end justifies the means. The, the prince, interestingly enough, it occurs to me as I'm talking here, in a, in a sense, Saul Alinsky, Saul Alinsky is a modern-day Machiavelli. Uh, he is a guy who was writing, just as Machiavelli did, a handbook for tyrants. I mean, the prince has been used <laughs> has been used by tyrants going from Lorenzo Medici straight through to uh, Joseph Stalin and beyond. I mean, they've all consulted the prince. Another line that occurs to me from from that book is the prince must possess the nature of both man and beast. Man and beast, who on the one hand is says all the right things in public and appears to be a benefactor to the people. And on the other, as the Medicis did, have their enemies sawn in half in a public square. The nature of both man and beast. I don't think Alinsky necessarily would admit it, but I'm sure Machiavelli was a massive influence on his own thinking. And the end justifies the means is an unofficial Alinsky slogan. It is certainly the thesis that runs straight through both of his books. If it advances the Marxist agenda, it is justifiable. This, by the way, is also Lenin. Alinsky's model for the seizure of power was to do whatever advances the, the cause. Anything that advances the cause is unscrupulous. And you must understand this if you were to understand the left. You cannot possibly understand the left unless you understand that from their point of view, there is no such thing as an unscrupulous tactic if it works. It's only unscrupulous if it doesn't work. If it works, it is justifiable. And, um, and it assumes Alinsky tactics, Marxist tactics, assume their opponents are restrained by conventional morality. It always assumes that you will, for instance, Regardless of what you think about the 2020 ele election, the left was counting on Donald Trump being restrained. No matter what they say about Trump, they were, they were counting on him even while questioning the outcome of the election. They were counting on him still stepping from office like a dutiful, obedient American who observes the Constitution of the United States. If the situation were reversed, there's no way Joe Biden steps out of the Oval Office. I mean, he might wander out of it because he's clearly nearly brain dead. But if his handlers are watching it, he doesn't escape from the room like a toddler. There's no way, there's no way that he leaves. There's simply no way. And it is because there's no such thing as unscrupulous tactics if the tactics work. You say anything, you do anything to get power and to maintain power. Now, the first book, Reveille for Radicals, is a handbook for organizing labor unions in American industry. But the second book, Rules for Radicals, which is by far the most influential of the two, is meant to be, as I said earlier, a sequel to Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. It's a it's a how-to manual for the destabilization and overthrow of existing power structures and the seizure of power. Alinsky dedicates the book to his wife, who I, I want to say her name is Elena. I have the book in electronic form. I don't have it here, here on the table. They don't want it polluting my shelves. I guess it just pollutes my phone, but my laptop. But he says this, in the acknowledgments. Lest we forget an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our legends, mythology, and history, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. End quote. 
Snopes never rely on Snopes. Snopes is a is an arm of the radical left. There's no question. But Snopes, so dishonestly, I mean, I don't I don't know how they live with themselves saying things like this. They're supposed to be like fact checkers, right? I mean, just the term itself, fact checkers, as I have as I've noted on a pr- previous podcast, that itself is like the ministry of truth. It's 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 Orwellian. It's just straight out of 1984. It's complete nonsense. But Snopes in 2016, leading up to the election in 2016, actually ran an article saying, fact check, did Saul Alinsky, did Saul Alinsky actually dedicate his book to Satan? And do you know what Snopes said? They said, nope, didn't. And the reason they brought this up is because Ben Carson had said that Hillary Clinton was a um, a disciple of Saul Alinsky, which she she was and probably remains. He's dead, but you know what I mean, through his books. And they said, you know, is it true what Ben Carson said, that she's she's a disciple of Saul Alinsky who dedicated his book to Satan? And Snopes said, and because they know that most people don't read beyond the, you know, the headline, they put mostly false. The claim is mostly false. Then as you read the article, they say, he doesn't dedicate it to Satan. He dedicate, he, he, he doesn't, he dedicates it to his wife. And then they say, now he did in his acknowledgments mention Lucifer, but he didn't mention Satan. <laughs> it's laughable. It's incredible. Didn't say Beelzebub. Didn't say the devil. Go and read it. It's, I mean, it's funny. Actually, go to their website, and or, or maybe not. Don't give them a click. But the point is that in order to kind of vindicate Hillary Clinton, they said, no, 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 this isn't true. No, but it is. It's basically true. He gives a whole page to say, I want to acknowledge Lucifer, Satan, the devil, Beelzebub. That tells you a little bit about Saul Alinsky, doesn't it? I think I've dedicated one of my books to my wife, one to my children. To be honest, off the top of my head, another to a good friend of mine. I haven't dedicated any to Satan. Don't plan to. And Stubb sort of treats it like, aha, it was just a joke. It was being funny. Say what you will. Saul Alinsky may not have believed in the devil, but I bet you he does now. Bet you he does now. Alinsky is important to understanding present-day America because his writings have been enormously influential on the left. A new generation is seeking to employ these tactics. And in a future podcast that I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about a man by the name of Lev Kapilev. You've maybe never heard of him, but Kapilev is a fascinating guy. I've read his memoirs, and uh, he he never knew Solinsky, never read Solinsky, I'm sure. But he was like an Alinskyite in the sense that he was seduced by, by Marxist ideology, and he talks about how he was willing to get into the ranks of the communists And he says, and I, with a clear conscience, took grain from Russian peasants knowing they would starve. Because I was sure that I belong to the one true party for all human good. He said, I committed acts of incredible evil, convinced that I alone was righteous and my cause was righteous and my party was righteous. This is Saul Alinsky. This is the, the, the kind of people who follow him. But Obama, Barack Obama, was Alinsky's most successful disciple by far and by proxy. Unlike Hillary Clinton, Obama never met Saul Alinsky, but he was a student of him nonetheless. He studied him very carefully the way a a pious man studies his Bible. Alinsky was, for Barack Obama, 
um, his Bible. It's what he read. And then, of course, listening to the, the hate-filled sermons of, of Reverend Jeremiah Wright. Go and listen to one of those on YouTube. See if you come away feeling edified. It's like listening to that woman we listened to at the beginning of this podcast. You see, Alinsky, like Jeremiah Wright, preached, in a sense, division. He stoked women, like we heard at the beginning of this podcast, into believing that she is a victim. I'm justified in speaking to you this way and in doing these things and in making these demands because I am a victim of your white supremacy or your, you know, um, patriarchy or whatever nonsense you want to fill that blank in with. Alinsky laid out a number of rules for first the seizure of power and secondly, for maintaining it. Rather than binding myself to his verbiage, um, I will instead, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the rules my own names so that you can, you know, sort of better understand um, what, what they are in a straight, straightforward reading of Alinsky. And by the way, these rules are found not just in uh, Rules for Radicals, but he wrote another little book that's called 13 Rules for Radicals. It's less famous, but it's, it's a summary of a summary. I mean, both of his books are, in a sense, a summary of Marxist thought. Neither of them are very big. I read an article this week where somebody referred to it as a tome. T-O-M-E. Tome, by the way, is a sponsor of this podcast. Check them out, tomeapp.com. But they refer to it as a tome, and I thought, the person writing this article has clearly never read Alinsky. The first of his rules is, as we mentioned before, divide and conquer. This is done through carefully targeted agitation of various people groups, playing on their latent fears and suspicions of one another. It's, it's like Shakespeare's Iago, the character of Iago in Othello. He's that guy who gradually poisons Othello's mind against the lovely and faithful Desdemona. He just keeps dripping into his ear that she is against you until Othello murders her. And it's only after he's murdered her that he realized she's innocent. But, it, but Iago had stoked him to it. Have you ever known these people in your life? Do you, do you know anybody who's like this? There are minor Iagos in our lives. Um, I think it's Harold Bloom, the uh, literary critic, um, who, who calls Iago an artist of evil. An artist of evil. He's a guy who doesn't really do the evil acts himself. He just stokes other people to do it. And this is Alinsky. This is what Alinsky says you should do. You through targeted agitation. This is Obama to a T. You want to understand Obama, you say all the, the right things out front, but then behind the scenes, you stoke the violence and you put virtually no restraint on any of it. Has there been anyone prosecuted, anyone at all, for the political violence that we've seen in our streets since the, say, 2019? I mean, it really intensified then. It was going on before then. Of course not. Yep, there are January 6 people who are still languishing in prison. It's like the writ of habeas corpus has been completely suspended. They get no right to trial. Some of them are in, uh, in, in isolation as though they are terrorists. We've let go the actual terrorists in Guantanamo Bay. By the way, I think that, that um, Obama, you can go and read an article that I've written in an interview that I did with my friend Chad Prather over at Blaze TV. Um, and also with Tony Perkins at Washington Watch. Um, Obama is the real president of the United States. You can find this article on my website, who's the real, the puppeteer, who's the real president of the United States. Uh, I'll maybe mention that in, a, in another podcast, but he's the guy who is, oh, Biden isn't doing any of this. Um, Biden himself is an empty suit. He is just simply a man who will sell his soul for power, and he has. And to that extent, he'd be willing to do anything. We know this. But Obama is an ideologue, meaning he is utterly devoted to his ideas and his philosophy. So is Hillary Clinton. And so was Saul Alinsky, who they both model themselves after. And so was Karl Marx, who Alinsky himself modeled himself after. So instead of stressing commonality, the tactic of divide and conquer is to do exactly the opposite. I mean, it's the, it is the opposite of the traditional American view of the American melting pot, that no matter what your ethnicity, 
whatever your, your family's background, your, your family is from Italy and mine is from England. You're black and I'm white. You're Catholic and I'm Protestant. We could still say we hold these truths self-evident. That we could come together and say this is worth fighting for. It's worth preserving. It's worth dying for. Their goal is the opposite of e pluribus unum. It is out of one many. It is to go in exactly the opposite direction, to fragment society, to turn people against one another so that they could then present themselves as the solution to the problem they've created. And by the way, this is the tactic of everyone who aspires to dictatorial power. You create a problem and then you present yourself as the solution to that problem. Yeah, uh, sitting off camera over here is my son, Zachary, uh, who is, you know, keeps his ear to the ground on these issues. And he's saying that I should say something to you about intersectionality and what intersectionality is. I've discussed that in another podcast, and yet it's worth repeating here. Intersectionality comes from Antonio Gramsci, the aforementioned um, Italian Marxist theorist, uh, to some extent, Georg Lukács, and that is that they saw that Marx said we divide society between the haves and the have-nots, between the, um, the peasant classes, the workers, the proletarians in Marx speak, and the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, the people in power. And as it was guys like Gramsci who said that's not working in America. And the reason it's not working in America is because the average worker can advance. If he works hard, little luck, saves his money, he might get promoted. He might move up. I mean, this is the American dream. I mean, it's Elon Musk. Think about it. Elon Musk came to the United States, and now he's the richest man in the world, or at least one of the richest men in the world. And he did it by working hard. He, he understands what makes America great because... If you've not spent time in another country, you might not understand that in some countries, it isn't about how hard you work. Somebody can come and with force of arms, take what you have in a moment. And it definitely happens in Africa and in his home country of South Africa. South Africa, as I've said, is a fascinating country. I've been there. It is not a great country. And what is going on there with the farmers, by the way, who are being driven off, white farmers who are being driven off their land, murdered as their farms are seized can't get ahead in a society like that. I mean, unless you're one of the, the people who's stealing from everyone else. And so intersectionality is the idea, okay, we need to divide society, not just between haves and have nots, but we need to divide it now this way. And that is between people groups. We define, we divide it between, so haves and have nots isn't working in America, but white versus black, that might work. Men against women might work work. We divide people, and it's how you end up with this woman saying, you're not allowed to come on my timeline without asking me, did you pick up? She said, you ask me, Lord? She says, I'm to be addressed as Lord? Wow. She says white people are to, to talk to her that way. And it's because she has been stoked, she's been manipulated, whether she knows it or not, that latent hate that resides in all of us and that we should all beat down like whack-a-mole. Whenever you sense that coming up into your heart, you need to beat that down. But she didn't. She gave it vent. She, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like Lord of the Rings. You know, she caressed it until it just has taken over her life, and now she's making stupid videos like this. So that's intersectionality. Intersectionality is the dividing of, of society in as many ways as possible, atomizing it so that every difference is, is accentuated and um, people are turned against one, one another. Second, one of his rules, create scapegoats. Create a vast, scary public enemy. For Hitler, it was the Jews. For um, Stalin, it was the Trotskyites and the Kulaks. Vast right-wing conspiracy, Hillary Clinton said famously, you know, uh, 20 years ago, Russia collusion narratives, coronavirus, white supremacists. You create scapegoats. It de deflects attention from what you're really doing. And this is what he said is Im important to do. Uh, third, create chaos. 
We've already covered this just a bit, but rioting, looting, and other criminal activities to your benefit. And it's to your benefit for this reason, because it paralyzes your opponent who is in office, presumably. And how is that? Because while you have all this rioting that's going on in the street, and let's just say that you know during the presidency of um, Donald Trump, if he does nothing, you say that he's weak. He's weak and indecisive. If he acts, so much the better. You then say, look at him. He's crushing the people underfoot. He's using troops. He's called in the National Guard. He's got these thuggish policemen who are out there beating people up. He is an oppressor of the people. That's what you do. Make it a movement. Number four, the Bolsheviks were always about the seizure of power in Russia. That was the goal. But to garner the support for their movement that they needed, they cleverly landed on a slogan. You know what their slogan was? Peace, bread, land. Who could possibly be against peace, bread, land? It's what every Russian in 1917 wanted. They were, they were losing badly World War I. Russian boys were getting slaughtered at the front against the Germans. For what? The Bolsheviks would say, well, that's just for the interests of the ruling class. It's just for the interests of the czar. It's just for the capitalists. What do you care? Peace. We'll bring peace. Bread. Huge bread lines. I've been in Russia several times, and I will tell you the bread lines continue <laughs> to some extent. And land. The peasants who comprised 80% of Russia's population at the time, they wanted land. So they garnered the support of people for their movement to seize power. And if the Russians thought that the czars were rough, that living under them was difficult, the Bolsheviks would bring suffering and death on a scale that would beggar the imagination so that people would be begging to return to czarist rule. But you cloak your cause behind a slogan that gives your cause mass appeal. Black lives matter. Who could be against that? I think that black lives matter. It's not what it's about. It's never been about black lives. It's about hijacking a people group and hijacking moral sentiment for a wicked cause. And this is what led um, Ludwig von Mises to refer to useful idiots, or rather he called them useful innocents. Uh, we have since given it a more cynical definition, <laughs> useful idiots. But those people, the young people who are out in the street, who are carrying the signs for trans rights and all this kind of stuff, they're just useful innocents, according to Ludwig von Mises. They're, they're individuals that you're using for your purpose of seizing power. They're just cannon fodder. That's all they are. Political trash talk, rule number five. Political trash talk works a little bit like if you've ever watched, say, football. I've already indicated that I'm a football fan, so I watch a lot of football whenever I can. And you ever see these instances where a, a flag is thrown on a guy for unsportsmanlike conduct, but then you watch the replay and you see that the other guy started it? He hits a guy. They always say, you know, that it's the second guy who gets it. So one guy hits another guy in the face, and then the other one lashes out and hits him. And it's the second guy that the referee sees. And he throws a flag on him. It happens all the time. And Alinsky says, ridicule is man's most potent weapon because it is almost impossible to counterattack. You attack people personally, says Alinsky. Someone says, I think that Biden's policy on the border is a flawed policy for these reasons. And then the response is, you're racist. What the hell does that have to do with border policy? How can we be a nation without a border? Alinsky says, attack personally. Insult. Attack their supposed lack of intelligence. Um, attack their their sensibilities, their, call, them, call them racist, no matter what they do. 
If they fly an American flag, they're racist. Uh, they're, they're white nationalists. You live in a nice house, you're an exploiter of the people. You vote Republican, you're a white supremacist. Make them feel shame, says Alinsky, and put them on the defensive so that they're rather than advancing their goals, they're responding to your claims, which you don't even believe anyway. If you've ever played chess, you know how this works. I used to play chess a lot when I was a kid. And, you know, sometimes you make moves in chess to put your opponent on the defensive just to keep him from mounting an offensive against you. You want to force him to react to you, constantly forcing him to react to you. This is strategy in, in almost any sport is to get your opponent out of rhythm where he cannot follow through with his own strategy because you're making him respond to you all the time. This is what Alinsky says you do. This is what you do. You create an air of cynicism about everything, about the country, about its history, about its heroes, about its institutions, about its leaders, about its values. This is why they encourage the toppling of statues and calling the founders all racists and these kinds of things. Because it's a way of undermining patriotism. It's a way of undermining values and annihilating values. Hitler says that when he was in Austria as a young man long before he you know, had started his Nazi movement in Germany, that he saw that this is the way the Social Democrats um, operated in Austria, in Vienna. And he said, I saw the way that they inflicted terror on their opponents with wild accusations that they knew weren't true, but that wounded the opposition in such a way that they were saying, but, but no, that's not true. We didn't do that. It's why when someone is accused of Oh, he's a racist. He's an exploiter of the people. He's an abuser of women. It forces that person to come out with a press conference and say none of that stuff is true. And the moment you start doing that, they've won. Because now you're off your game. Now you're off your strategy. And they don't believe it anyway. Another advantage of ridicule, says Alinsky, is it infuriates the opposition who then react to your advantage. They're reacting. You're setting the tempo. Rule number six, disinformation. We all know what this looks like. Disinformation. You're constantly putting out headlines in your own papers if you're not yet in power. You're constantly holding press conferences accusing your rivals of unscrupulous things. You have a, a, a relentless campaign of disinformation information. If you're, you know, it's very interesting in uh, William Shire's great classic, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Shire makes this observation. He was in Germany during Hitler's rise to power. So, I mean, he was, he was an eyewitness of it. And this is something that he said, I myself was to experience how easily one is taken in by lying and censored press and radio in a totalitarian state, though unlike most Germans, I had daily access to foreign newspapers, especially those of London, Paris, and Zurich, which arrived the day after publication. And though I listened regularly to the BBC and other foreign broadcasts, my job necessitated the spending of many hours a day in combing the German press, checking the German radio, conferring with Nazi officials, and going to party meetings. It was surprising and sometimes consternating to find that notwithstanding the opportunities I had to learn the facts, and despite one's inherent distrust of what one learned from Nazi sources, a steady diet over the years of falsifications and distortions made a certain impression on one's mind and often misled it. No one who has not lived for years in a totalitarian land can possibly conceive how difficult it is to escape the dread consequences of a regime's calculated and incessant propaganda. I mean, he says, I was aware that the stuff they were saying was overwhelmingly false, and yet it still affected the way I thought. How many people who voted for Trump almost are apologetic about it? 
That's the result of a steady media campaign that has portrayed him as a fascist. So that people want to, and my point here isn't by the way who you should or shouldn't vote for. My point is a steady diet of falsifications has an effect. It has an effect so that many people now are apologetic for being a Christian. Many people are apologetic for just being white. Think of that. You think you're not being affected by the media that isn't influencing you? I promise you it is influencing you in a in a big way. Rule number seven, the thing is never the thing. According to Alinsky, that's a direct quote, the thing is never the thing. You sometimes find yourself wondering, what's, what's going on in the culture? What's causing all this? Is it about justice for George Floyd? Is it about ending police brutality? Is it about ending racism? Is it about equality? Is it about trans rights? It's none of the above. Again, Alinsky said the thing is never the thing. The idea is to obfuscate the issues by continually moving the goalposts. Keep your enemy frustrated in his search to find out what it is that you want. Don't give him the end game that he wants. Keep him on his heels. Don't be reasonable. But continually accuse your opponent of being unreasonable. When he meets your demands, make more demands. When he meets those, make still more. That's what you do. Senator Tim Scott was in discussions with Senate Democrats about the so-called Justice Act. And Scott said this, I offered to include an amendment for every concern that was presented by Democrats. They offered zero and walked out. That's Saul Alinsky. I'm sure they weren't, they weren't ready for Tim Scott to say, okay, I agree. All right, good. Then they turn right around and make more. That's the way it works. Alinsky says this, you cannot risk being trapped by the enemy in his sudden agreement with your demands. You cannot. Rule number eight, seize power. This is done, as I say, by presenting yourself to the solution to the problems that you create. Do you remember, do you remember what Biden's deeply dishonest campaign slogan was about? Unity. Unity. They're burning down whole cities. They're causing riots in the streets and they're going, oh, well, look at all this that's happened because of our political opponents. Look at what Christians and white supremacists and Republicans and MAGA hat wearing people are doing. You do it and then you present yourself as the solution will bring unity. This is Adolf Hitler to a T. This is Adolf Hitler to a T. Alinsky says radicals must remain flexible and opportunistic and say anything to get power. That's a direct quotation of Alinsky. Interestingly enough, I, um, I, I don't remember which news agency it was. I want to say it's Reuters, but perhaps not. Ran an article a few years ago in which they said, why do conservatives hate Saul Alinsky so much? Are you kidding me? Man writes in his book that he's he's wants to acknowledge Satan. Oh, excuse me, it wasn't Satan, it was Lucifer. <laughs> and the man says, do anything to get power. And you have media running inter interference for Saul Alinsky to say, what's wrong with these people? Why wouldn't they like him? He's like reading Mark Twain. Reading, reading Saul Alinsky is, is just like reading Dave Barry back in the day. Hardly. Then, once in power, rule number, number nine, ideologically reform the levers of popular coercion. By popular coercion, I mean the instruments of power to coerce the population. And those are two institutions, the police and the military. That is going on right now. Defund the police is about purging the police of those people who adhere to the Constitution. If you've been around long enough, you probably have found yourself pulled over by a police officer, a sheriff's deputy, a state trooper, perhaps. If you're in real trouble, then maybe a federal agent. <laughs> 
most of the time, my exchanges with them are reasonable. Not always. You sometimes run into a jerk. But I recall some years ago, a guy pulling me over and saying that I was, you know, was in the wrong lane to turn. And I pointed out to him that there's no paint on the road. How could he say that I was in the turning lane too early when there's no indication as to where the turning lane begins? And he accepted that as a valid point. All right. Wear your seatbelt. Have a good day. Meaning that we're used to, usually not always, to talking with law enforcement officials who at some level share our values and have some decency and common sense. I do understand. I've run into them. Individuals who aren't like that. If you've had a bad experience, don't extrapolate that one experience out to absolutely everybody. But they want to make your bad experience to become the norm. And that's by purging the police. And it's happening. How many military people have you talked to who said, I'm retiring because of all, of all the woke nonsense? I'm getting out. I've talked to fighter pilots. I've talked to officers in every, every branch of the military who said, I couldn't take any more. I'm getting out. That's what they want. Because they want guys like General Milley. They want guys like General Milley in charge. <clears throat> so ideologically reform the instruments of power. Rule number 10, suppress dissent with force and the threat of force. Weaponizing the IRS. 87,000 new IRS agents. And how many fact checks came out about that? Said, well, it's not exactly 87,000. It's 84,000. Why would they be doing that and sending IRS agents through gun training? What's up with that? Is to weaponize them against the people, against a, a, a domestic population. Suppress dissent. Rule number 11, burn books. And this is being done electronically even now. Do you, did you know that with updates on your phone and on your laptop, the books that you download on, let's say, Audible or what's what's... Apple's version of actual books. Is it like Apple Books? Something like that. Kindle. You know, you can get Kindle on here as well. I have both. With those updates, hidden in those updates, they can come into your, your library and edit them. Change them. They do it occasionally. Sometimes for good reason. Because, say, an author like me, I hope you all have my books downloaded on your iPhone. On both apps, by the way. You need it on both. But... Somebody like me maybe sees in the electronic version a typo or a, um, a formatting error. You call up the publisher and you say, and they go, yeah, yeah, we'll add that to the updates. And then when you update, it goes in and it fixes it. But they can also change it just by editing it, by pulling something out that they find to be objectionable. So this, is, this goes on. It goes on in a real way. But burning books... The idea here is to eliminate free speech because free speech is, is deemed dangerous to the regime. They use free speech against the existing regime, but once in power, they, they eliminate free speech. They create a single-party system. And the way they eliminate free speech is the way they're trying to eliminate it right now is they're saying that it is dangerous to public safety. This podcast is on YouTube. How long it will be on YouTube, I don't know. Maybe we'll get booted off. So be it. Find me on Twitter. It's a free platform <laughs> for now. Free speech platform for now. Find us on Rubble, Rumble if we get booted off of here. But if you go on here and start saying things about um, vaccines and election rigging and all that kind of stuff, you're gone. That's my friend Eric Metaxas, booted straight off. of. Um, and then I think Candace Owens was booted off like maybe last week, week before. Boot it off. I don't know what it was she said, but something the regime decided they didn't like, meaning it's not really a free speech platform. It just isn't. And they determine what it is you can and you cannot say. What I consider to be more dangerous than false information is a regime that suppresses information of any kind. Because you see, what they're saying when they say that quote, disinformation, or the word they've invented is misinformation. 
which is Orwellian, you know, doublespeak. What they mean by that is we're the ones who are the arbiters of truth. We're the ones who determine what's safe for you to hear. A traditional American view has been, yeah, national acquirers exist, Snopes exist, fact checkers exist. American Aurora back in the colonial period, period full of disinformation. But the American people make their own determinations about what they do and don't believe and what they do and don't read. And if you want to read L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics and believe that you get your own planet, you know, or something like that, fine. Just stay in your lane. Rule number 12, create a sense of ongoing eminent threat from an exaggerated or fictitious enemies. An ongoing eminent threat. The Trotskyists, the Jews, the fascists, evangelical Christians. Have you seen the way the Biden administration, the FBI, has been going after the Catholic Church? Big time. Biden giving a speech and saying the greatest threat to America is white supremacists. Where are all these people? Climate change. Climate change. And as I pointed out on an earlier podcast on here, the, uh, the 1991 um, academic paper, which I've discussed in discussing the World Economic Forum, uh, called The First Global Revolution. This is what informs groups like the World Economic Forum and various others. The First Global Revolution said, what we have to do is create an enemy, a noble lie in the Platonic sense. Read Plato's Republic, he talks about the noble lie. That is a lie that we unite the people uh, around, but they don't know that it's actually a lie. And in the first global revolution, 1991, they say, we've determined that the real, the real great lie is to tell people that it's climate, it's the ecology, because that's something that goes across the board that everybody can worry about. It doesn't matter whether you're, you're a, a Muslim, whether you're a communist, whether you're, whether you're Hindu, what your nationality, we can all unite around that. And they said, that, that needs to be the thing we tell everybody. Greta Thunberg just last week looked like an idiot. Do you remember why? Because she had said five years ago in 2018, in June of 2018, she said, in five years, basically, we, the, the earth will explode like the Death Star unless we adopt all these radical environmental policies. Didn't happen. And unfortunately, Greta is still with us. And rule number 13, rig elections. Rig elections. Once in power, you rig elections. Have you noticed what's happened in South America? I've been paying close attention. I have a lot of friends there. I'm in South America an awful lot. And just in the last couple of years, Chile, Chile, the most stable democracy in South America has fallen to Marxists. Colombia has fallen to Marxists. Brazil has fallen to Marxists. Peru has fallen to Marxists, and Honduras has fallen to Marxists, all five of them in a very short period of time, and all under highly suspicious, dubious elections that were going strongly in the other direction, and then all of a sudden the counting stops, <laughs> and a few days later they say somebody else won. This is exactly what the Marxists did in um, uh, Richard Wormbrand's Romania, when they took power in 1948, they held free elections. They regretted it. And they were losing to a Romanian nationalist party, kind of a farmer's party, as I recall. It's been a while. I think by 80%. And the election counting stopped. <laughs> stopped. And then a couple of days later, the communists were declared the winners. And were the communists ever voted out? Of course not. They were never voted out. They were killed. A lot of them in the revolution of 19, I think it's 1989, when Nicholas Ceausescu, the, uh, the longtime dic dictator there, was, um, was captured and executed through the freedom wave that went across Eastern Europe and ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. But they, were never they never lost an election. Once Marxists are in power, they never lose elections. It's so weird. They're like, oh, they're, they're, they're 100%. Their batting average is perfect once in power. 
So you need to pay attention to this. These are the rules for radicals that Alinsky stressed in a very good way. Revelation 6, 8 says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. Can't know this, but I've often wondered if that verse is a reference to socialism. Marxism is a variant of socialism. All Marxists are socialists. Not all socialists are Marxists, but with a body count of more than 125 million people in the 20th century alone, you wonder if the pale horse with death sitting on it isn't a reference to this very, very dangerous ideology. Now, whether it is or not, only time itself will, will tell. But regardless, history has demonstrated all too clearly that death and hell follow this murderous worldview wherever it goes. And yet, the arrogance of guys like Saul Alinsky and the people that we currently have roaming the corridors of American power, of American entertainment, of American academy, that is to say the, the uh, educational system, they're all arrogant enough to believe that it really can work. It really can work. I attribute this in part not just to evil hearts, the aforementioned reference, Jeremiah 17, 9, but I also attribute it to the fact that there has become a complete indifference in American, maybe I should say in Western academic circles, a complete indifference for history. A complete indifference for history. It's like history, it just does not matter. It can tell us nothing about the future. And I want to say this to you, uh, for those of you, because again, my podcast, the purpose of my podcast is not just to give you an avalanche of negative information so that at the end, in the, at the end of this show, you think, gosh, that was, that was very interesting. It was very depressing. I think I'll go slip my wrists now. That's, that's not my goal with this podcast. I want to equip you. I want to inform you. I want to encourage you. I want to mobilize you. But you need to know your enemy. You need to understand your enemy. And I'm a Christian. You need to understand that. As I've said many times before, um, 2 Corinthians 10.5 is my motto. Um, we destroy, there the Apostle Paul says, we destroy arguments and every lofty pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. I can't, I can't make you walk the path to salvation, but I do hope I can make you see it clearer. So the way I do that is through the destruction of argument, through this, the destruction of the ideas of a guy like Saul Alinsky. I want to expose them to you. The World Economic Forum, I want to expose them to you so that you can see when they are split open and laid bare what's inside, what they are all about. So all this can feel very overwhelming. And as I was talking to my wife, I thought, wow, you know, what can I do? What can any of us do? And that's when I felt the Holy Spirit, you know, speaking to me and saying, let the saints equip you. Let the saints equip you. Larry, there is nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Your forebearers, generations have dealt with this. They have dealt with this ideology and they dealt with it successfully. Some of them died, many of them died, but not before they equipped you. They've equipped you. Go to them. Let them tell you their stories. Let them tell you the heart. Read Read Dostoevsky. I mention him on almost every podcast because there is absolutely no one that you can read who will better help you understand, even, even though it's, you know, now some of his works on, on this issue are now more than 150 years old. Go and read Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Read Lev Kopelev, the guy that I just made reference to, K-O-P-E-L-E-V, Lev Kopelev. Read him. He will help you to understand this. Read... Uh, any number, go and read uh, Richard Wormbrand. Richard Wormbrand is a very quick and easy read. If you, you feel intimidated by reading, you know, eight, 900 pages of Dostoevsky, <laughs> um, you can go and read Richard Wormbrand's little book called Marx and Satan. It's about 90 pages. It'll blow your head off. If that even is too challenging for you. Go and read, you find it online. 
Actually, I think it's on a Mormon website. It's like Joseph Smith Foundation or something. But go and read Richard Warren Brand's 1966 Senate testimony. It's the Senate minutes. It's the Senate record. All it is is just he said, he said, he said, he said. And it's Warren Brand telling his story. He's a Lutheran pastor who um, had been imprisoned by the communists, by the Marxists. And Warren Brand's testimony is so powerful. I, I don't recall how long it is, not that terribly long, but you will become so engrossed in it, you won't be able to put it down. Let the saints equip you, Larry. Let the saints equip you because they will, because they've been here. Don't let their deaths be in vain so that you understand what this is. Alinsky, like Antonio Gramsci and Georg Lukash, and just just to remind you, Antonio Gramsci was an Italian political theorist. Uh, he was imprisoned by Mussolini. And because of that, many assume, ah, he's a good guy. <laughs> you know, Hitler and Mao and Stalin and uh, uh, Mussolini did occasionally imprison people who were actually as evil as they were. You know, murderers, rapists, this kind of thing. And Antonio Gramsci was... was was evil to his black-hearted core, not because he necessarily killed anyone personally. Same with for Georg Lukács. And Georg Lukács was a Hungarian Marxist political theorist. They're guys that are just like Saul Alinsky, except they just weren't Americans. And they're Marxist political theorists. They're Marxist, you might think of them as Marxist military strategists who thought in terms of how to advance the Marxist agenda in America. And that, mean, that meant capturing America's institutions, toppling them, and taking the reins of, par of power. They thought like an enemy strategist thinks about how to take a fortress. And for generations, Marxist theorists thought in terms of breaching America's walls, the fortifications of America. A frontal assault. And Alinsky said no, like Gramsci and also like Georg Lukács. The American fortress, he argued, is too strong to be attacked that way. Do you know what the weakest? I've given tours at, at many European um, castles and fortresses. And, uh, you know, you learn this. You know what the weakest part of a fortress is? It's the gate. It's the door. That is the weakest part of any, any castle, any fortification. It is the gate. And uh, that's the reason why in ancient times, gatekeepers were paid very, very well. And it was because you didn't want that guy becoming a traitor, you know, somebody else paying him more to open the gate. And so Alinsky, Alinsky, you know, he was arguing, you know, this is, this is the way in. Alinsky argued was, if we can turn the gatekeepers, we can take the whole base. We can take the entire fortress. The castle itself will fall to us like a ripe fruit. His influence on Hillary Clinton, whom David Brock called Alinsky's daughter, not literally, but he just meant she was that much. Ben Carson was 100% right. Ignore Snopes. She is, ideologically speaking, Alinsky's daughter. And that relationship has been well documented. I mean, Hillary Clinton wrote her senior thesis at Wellesley on Saul Alinsky. She met with him. He tried to hire her when she graduated from, um, from Wellesley. And uh, she turned it down. She told him that she was going to um, go to Yale Law School. And he told her she was wasting her time. She should come, you know, she should come to work for him. And um, then upon graduation, you know, she, there's a letter that came to light some years ago of, of her correspondence with him where she wanted to meet with him again. And she's talking about how wonderful he is and, and this kind of thing. I want to close with this. The real enemy of socialism, of Marxism, of fascism, of all political programs that aspire to totalitarian rule is the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. It is, it is the weapon against it. And it's because the Christian faith, the Bible, teaches the dignity of human beings. It teaches that human beings matter more than governments. Jesus said the Sabbath was meant for man, not man for the Sabbath. The same may be said for government. Government was meant for man, not man for government. 
But you see, in Marxist and socialist and fascist regimes, it's the other way around. You serve the government. You live for the government. You are a temporal being serving an eternal state. In the biblical model, it's reversed. You're an eternal being served by a temporal institution, the state. Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, the devil, as Snopes would have it, as depicted in the Bible, isn't creative. All he can do is pervert God's creation. And that, by the way, is the way socialism and Marxism and all of its variants operate. They only seek to pervert what is good. But my final, final words to you are this, don't lose heart. Uh, I believe in a big God, and I believe that we're supposed to play to win. I only play to win. I talk to so many Christians these days who talk like, well, you know, I guess we just, we just continue to polish the decks on a sinking ship. No, no, we advance. Someone said to me in the comments on YouTube, well, the LGBT mob is, is advancing. Well, so are we, we should be. So what I would encourage you is to remember that we serve a great God, or as I like to say on this podcast, we serve him who said, let there be light. It gets no bigger than that. And so I hope on this podcast that you are encouraged. I hope you will pray. I hope you will learn and I hope you will engage the people around you.